Hey guys, it's Will. It's Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, thank you for finding me. If you could give us a sub or like a thumbs up, comment, all that fun stuff. We are here today to talk about Ringo Lam, Hell to the S. I've been talking about Ringo Lam a lot recently. I was going through this in my head and I think I've I think I've think watched five or six of his movies this year and I've reviewed almost all of them on the channel. So it's been a big year for Ringo Lam fandom. One of my favorite movies ever is Wild Search, which you can see right here from Eureka. And today we are talking about Full Alert. This is a Ringo Lam film released in 1997. It stars Shia Lau and Francis Ng. Ringo Lam directed it. He also um, co-wrote the script from an original story of his own devising. So he's very heavily involved in this film from start to finish. There's a lot to unpack about this movie. This is a release from Eureka. It is a Region B release. It is out November 22nd of 2021. This is a dark thriller. This is a, uh, it's a really interesting film because as you know, Ringo Lam makes very dark, violent thrillers, but kind of the classic Ringo Lam thriller, Wild Search, City on Fire, Prison on Fire, Touch and Go, which I recently reviewed, which I loved. These are very character driven films. This movie is a really precise and exacting and methodical procedural. And in that respect, really reminds you of Johnny Toe. If you've seen a lot of Johnny Toe films, Election, Election 2, Exiled, uh, a little bit less or so Exiled, which is kind of a little bit more character driven, but it's still in that vein. Drug War, um, The Mission, like those classic Johnny Toe movies are very precise and exacting procedurals with extreme attention to detail. That's kind of the type of movie this is. Also think of that Milky Way stuff from the late 90s, like The Longest Night, Expect the Unexpected. These are films that I have over here that Spectrum Films has released. And Spectrum actually has released Full Alert. So that, that's the Spectrum release, just if you want to see that. Um, I have watched this movie. This is not an exaggeration. I think five times in the last six months because I watched that Spectrum release. I watched the Eureka release. I watched it again with the Frank Jen commentary. I watched it again with the Ringo Lang commentary. And then the Ringo Lang, excuse me. And then there is a Frank Jen interview with Peter Cam, who did the music for this film um, that is set up. It's like almost 90 minutes long and it's set up as a commentary track. So I, I watched it with all the commentary tracks and I watched the movie twice on its own. So I watched it four times <laughs> over the weekend. So so uh, I'm like really saturated in Ringo Lamb right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about how the Eureka release looks and about the remaster and about the quality of the film and stuff like that. And then I'm going to talk to you about my thoughts on this movie because I've watched it so many times this year. I'm like, I might as well just do my own kind of like review of it as well. Right. And then I'm going to talk to you about the bonus material on yours. This might be a bit of a longer video and I apologize for that. This movie looks fantastic on here. And one of the things that's really interesting. So I watched this on a 59 inch TV. So it's pretty big. So you can see the details. Right. And uh, there's a lot of grain in the like the texture of the film right now what Ringo Lamb talks about in his commentary track is that they really deliberately shot this film low light because it's supposed to look like it would actually look if you were inside these spaces right now in some cases like there's one scene where they're outside on the street in Hong Kong and they move into a building and it's shot on location they're just like we're not just going to put lights all over this building like because they didn't get permits for anything on this movie I will talk about that later but all of it is stolen which is insane if you know anything about filmmaking and permits and stuff like that. I know that's common practice in Hong Kong, but as someone who lives in LA and like around the LA film industry, and I've gone through the whole process of getting permits before and like all that stuff, like that's insane. And so like they're not putting up lights in exterior locations. So there's a lot of kind of darkness and shadows, but with regards to the stuff that they could control, they, there's a really interesting anecdote that Ringo Lam tells about one scene in which Sean Lau is there. It's an interrogation room and Sean Lau plays a cop and he's standing in the back of the room and you can't really see his face. And Ringo Lam says that the camera crew actually asked Ringo Lamb specifically for permission to relight the scene and reshoot it so that there was more light and you could see Sean Lau's face. And he was like, yeah, fine, do it. But he liked the shadow version more. So it's very deliberately not a super bright movie. This is about people who live in shadows. It's about moral shadows, moral ambiguity, and it's about anxiety and uncertainty. The film was released in 1997, which is the year of the handover. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But all of this is very deliberately designed to address what was happening with the handover and the anxieties around it. So suffice it to say, the print looks incredible. The stuff that's shot outside, like the remaster, the stuff that's shot outside, it's like just like amazing as you would expect a Blu-ray to look. And then the stuff that's shot like I said, on the locations that they control has this really moody kind of moody kind of like film noir lighting, which I really, really liked. So I talked about Johnny Toe. Um, 
there's a focus on the minutia. I'm just looking at my notes here to make sure I don't forget anything. There's a focus on the minutia of the events in the lives of these characters here that uh, to me really shows Ringo Lamb at the height of his craft. And it was also really interesting to see him digging into the procedural aspects. As I talked about when I reviewed Wild Search, which like I said, is like one of my all time favorite movies. The attention to detail that Ringo Lamb plays in every single scene with every single character when you really watch the films is kind of astounding. Now, I know that this is something that is not just happening in my head because I interviewed Michael Chan, who was in a couple Ringo Lamb films, and he said that the way Ringo Lamb directs is he will talk to every actor that is in a scene about where they are mentally where all the other characters are and what their dynamics are and how they're interacting with one another and how the physical things that they're doing connect to the mental things that they're doing, connecting to the physical and mental things that everyone else is doing. That level of attention to detail really, really comes through here. To give you one example of that, there's a scene where the cops are going to break into this apartment where the criminals have set up a gas leak and a guy has his gun out and the Sean Lau character says, put your gun away. If it sparks, everything's going to blow up. And then they're like, okay, let's kick in the door. And one of the guys is like, that door has a metal lock on it. Um, if, if we kick it too hard at the location of the lock, it's going to spark and blow up, right? And then one of the characters is like, well, let me kick it instead of you because you have a kid. So you go down there. And like the way that they all, all these characters interact and the way that they relate to one another and the way that they hone in on every single detail that would realistically be occurring in these circumstances, I, it's just like, it's this is like filmmaking at the absolute highest level in my mind. And that's Peter Cam actually says that too in his interview. He talks about how Johnny Toe and Ringo Lamb of all the filmmakers he worked with were really on a different level. And they actually really reminded him of one another in his experience of working with them. So I'm going to talk about that later when I talk about the bonus features. But that's one of the things that really blew my mind about this film is that attention to detail in every single scene. Like this is the craft of filmmaking at its height. And it's just such a great movie. Um, amazing locations. And again, when I talk about Ringo Lamb's commentary, I'll go back to that. But there's a specific reason for those locations. Um, and, you know, Ringo Lamb, one of the things I love about him is he really digs into the moral. In addition to the, the physical aspects of everything that these people are going through, he digs into the moral aspects of it, too. Now, I have long suspected that even though Ringo Lamb makes really violent, bleak, nihilistic, almost like over-the-top movies in some circumstances, like full contact is kind of like over-the-top, right? Um, I think that he's a humanist. In, in a similar way to Kurosawa, being a kind of very humanist filmmaker who had a lot of compassion for people but made very dark, violent movies. I think I've long suspected that Ringo Lamb is the same because a lot of his movies, like this movie, is really digs into the idea that Cops and criminals is ultimately a zero-sum game. The criminals are out for a big score. The cops are out for a big bust, right? And sure, the cops can bust the criminals and maybe some innocent people. The, the, the criminals in this film are, um, they're thieves, right? So it's not, there's not really too much of a risk of civilians getting hurt with robbery, right? There is a little bit, but not, it's not, they're not like murderers, right? It's not like, high stakes in terms of saving people's lives. It's really about the criminals want something, the cops want something, they're they're both kind of going for it head to head, and there doesn't really seem to be any moral high ground. And it's a system that puts these people in contest with one another, and the only people who really benefit from it at all are the really, really rich people, right? And you see this in Wild Search. The bad guy, he like runs a corporation, right? And he benefits from all of these bad things and no one else really does. They live, they die, they have highs, they have lows, and that's it. And I see that a lot in Full Alert too, in that, you know, the good guys can catch the criminals, but that doesn't make any difference in their lives. And some of them are going to die along the way. And, and maybe the criminals will will get a bunch of money and they'll get away, but they got to kick up and like they got to divide it and it's not going to last them for the rest of their lives. And like you see a lot of this turmoil of like all of these people are in bad situations and there are no good decisions. They just have to choose between crappy options basically and try to stay alive. And, and the idea of like doing the right thing kind of just doesn't exist. And but but so when I said that I long suspected that Ringo Lamb was a humanist, I think that he's making these films because he's looking at a tragic world. 
rather than being a nihilist who's just like, ah, let's just kill everyone. He's more like, it really sucks that these are the decisions people have to make. And like, obviously you could choose to be a criminal and you're, you, you make your bed and you lie in it, right? And I don't think that he's necessarily saying like everyone is a victim of circumstance. I think what he's saying is the fact that these systems exist and that we can't break out of them and that entire lives are lost to them is a tragedy. And he actually says in the commentary track during one of the car chase scenes, this was a dangerous scene to shoot and no one was hurt. Praise Buddha. And that was really interesting to me because Kurosawa was a Buddhist too. And you know, like Ron famously is about what is a world in which there is no Buddha, right? And Kurosawa has a lot of kind of Buddhist themes in his films. And, and, and he wasn't like, you know, I go to temple every weekend kind of thing, but he had this kind of Buddhist humanist thing going on, right? And and I see that with Ringo Lamb too. And those parallels, I think, are really, really interesting. So um, that's just kind of my thoughts on watching this film. If you, if you don't care about the, you know, the minutia of the craft or like the moral aspects of it, this is a really solid, awesome thriller. It has one of the best car chases, I think, ever in Hong Kong cinema. So what I want you to do, if you're still watching the video at this point, tell me in the comments, what are your favorite car chases in Hong Kong cinema? Because this has got to be top five. Like this car chase is incredible. So awesome shootouts like it's a really really good entertaining thriller but you can dig below the surface and find a lot more which i think you see a lot in most of ringo lamb's films so to talk about the ringo lamb commentary he actually only talks for about 15 minutes or so like he'll say a bunch of stuff and then he'll be quiet for like 10 minutes of the movie and then you're like is he still there and then he'll start talking again so you kind of have to watch the whole movie to get everything that he's going to say but so He's, he, he made Maximum Risk before this, right? And then he made Burning Paradise, I think, which was made in China. And so he was out of Hong Kong for a long time when he made this film. And with the handover impending, he says in his commentary track he wanted to come back to Hong Kong and he wanted to make a 100% Hong Kong film that would use as many locations around Hong Kong as possible to preserve them as they were in their state as Hong Kong before the handover, before potential change, before all this stuff that was happening, right? And and the constant anxiety that I see in the plot of this film, all of the characters are just living with constant anxiety because there are all these horrible things that could be happening and they're trying to get through without all of these things happening, but they know that inevitably they can't stop all of these things from happening. So it's constant fear of the future and constant anxiety of the present while also they're frequently thinking about their past, which really, I think, encapsulates this moment. And I don't know a ton about the feeling of Hong Kong at the moment of the handover, right? Obviously, because I'm not a Hong Konger and I wasn't there. But from what everyone tells me, from what I read, from what I hear in these commentary tracks, that's kind of what... And that you see that in Expect the Unexpected and The Longest Night, which people have written and, and commented before about how those films are very clearly about the anxieties of the handover, right? And I think this is a kind of a very similar film to those in its in its tone and in the um, kind of the way that it's put together. So, so Ringo Lamb was really trying to make a really like Bird Street, which is a which was a famous street where all these bird markets were. I guess um, this is the last Hong Kong film shot there, and he very deliberately wanted to shoot there to preserve that. There's one scene where a caravan of police is driving this criminal to a courthouse from all the way at the bottom of Hong Kong Island to all the way at the top of it, from like kind of like the sticks up into like the center of the city. And and Frank actually, Frank Jang talks in his commentary, and so does Ringo Lamb, about how they used the actual route that you would drive. They didn't do any cheating of like, we want to film here and here. Like they filmed every single piece of that drive to capture a whole kind of movement through that island before everything changed. With or And even if it didn't change, like the fear is there, the anxiety is there that this is Hong Kong, this is where we grew up, this is our culture, this is our city, this is our place, these are our films. It, like it needs to be preserved as it is because there's this anxiety about change. Um, and he talks about the lighting, like I said, which I thought was really interesting. And that he, one of the things that he talks about that I think is really cool is he talks about the difficulty of filming on the street in Hong Kong. Like you're never going to get permits. Frank talked a lot about this in my most recent interview with him. So if you're interested, go watch that. But you're never going to get permits to shoot this stuff. So they had to steal everything. So like in the car chase, they've got stunt drivers padding like around the cars that are driving and all the actors did their own stunt driving. And they're just stealing all these shots, driving through all these locations. Like there's shootouts in the street. There's one scene where Sean Lau almost got, actually got hit by a bus. They're driving on tram tracks while the trams are coming. So they're just like doing that. Like it's insane. He actually said in the commentary that he's really surprised and that Sean Lau and Francis Ng didn't get injured on this movie. And he was really worried that they would. 
because he said they really completely threw themselves into their performances and like it, he, it was just kind of astounding to witness. There's one scene where the Sean Lau character, his gun gets thrown in like this big barrel of trash. Like it's dis it's like wet food trash. And he dumps it over and rifles through it to find his gun. And you can tell that it's not like, like this, the props department did not place that there. It's like rotten, wet food trash. And he's just like digging through it on the street, like soaking wet, looking for his gun. Like they really, really gave their all to this film. And it's really incredible to witness. So that's a great commentary track. Frank's commentary track, was a fantastic he explains like the chinese title of the film um all of the locations i'm like a location junkie for hong kong cinema i will actually go and on google earth after i watch a movie and try to find all the locations so frank lists like during the car chase he's like they're on this street now they're on this street now they're on this street now they're on this street and, like there's guys talking on the walkie talkies the cops with to each other during the car chase being like oh he's over here he's over here and frank is like those are all the actual locations that they're talking about like and there's a scene where there's a building on nathan road he's like that's actually on Nathan Road and they shot that in that actual building the address that they say in the movie is the actual address of that building like it's really amazing to have and he talks about Wang Jai and like what that how that you know the central district and like all these parts of Hong Kong that I hear about so often in these films Frank actually connects them through the geography of this film so it's really really cool um frank's character analysis is really spot on in this and i really got a lot out of that there's actually one shot in this movie that's frank's elementary school so that's really really cool because he gets you know there's like a little nostalgia moment there that i really liked i mean he talks about the history of the trams in hong kong which i knew nothing about that was super cool uh and there's there's a thing in this movie where you have this group of criminal there's a multiple groups of characters in this movie right so it's not just like cops and criminals there's a bunch and one of the groups is uh taiwanese and Frank talks about how the Taiwanese characters are very clearly meant to be actually from mainland China. And he explains how Hong Kongers would know that while watching the film. Ringo Lam leaves these little breadcrumbs. But because of the sensitivity about making mainland Chinese out to be criminals during the handover, they made them Taiwanese in the film. It's really, really interesting. I never would have known that. Um, Frank also points out which three members of the cast of this film were triads in real life. So that was really interesting. Um... And then the one other thing that I, I mean, I loved Frank's commentary on this and I could geek out about it for a long time, but I want to keep this video not insanely long. Um, there's a bomb in this movie that has, uh, there's like a scene where the cops respond to like a bomb, right? There's like a bomb under a car in a parking lot. And the bomb has something written on it. And Frank explains that the thing that's written on it is, I'm going to read it to you, don't come near comrades. And that's actually a reference to pro-Chinese communist terrorism and violence that was happening at some point in the 80s i think where the bomb makers would write this message on these bombs and there's a lot more historical context to that that i'm not going to spoil for you because i want you to go and buy this release and listen to the commentary track but like throughout this entire movie there's all of these references to things that i would never in a million years catch and frank goes into so much detail on that and it's really incredible so the last thing i'm going to talk to you about here is the peter cam interview like i said this is almost 90 minutes long the movie runs 98 minutes oh one other thing that frank actually points out that's really interesting is that the original runtime of this movie when it was released in hong kong is longer and there's one tiny scene that really doesn't affect the plot at all or anything like that that is not in all of the blu-ray releases the spectrum one i think there's a hong kong one in this one the scene is just gone and frank doesn't know why but that's really interesting so um uh so peter cam one of the things i found really interesting about this is he talks about the movie that made him want to write movie music and he talks about i don't want to tell you what it is because i want you to go and listen to it because it's really interesting to hear him tell his own story but he talks about how seeing that movie when he was a teenager and the one particular scene really really emotionally affected him and, and made him really notice the music and how much emotion the music was bringing to the scene. And I thought that was really, really fascinating. Um, like I said, he talks about Johnny Toe. And it, one of the things that he says that's really funny that I, I really liked was that he said, working with Johnny Toe and Ringo Lam, you never know if you're doing a good job. They'll only tell you if you do something wrong. So he's like, I don't know if Ringo Lamb likes the music to this movie. I know he doesn't not like it, but I don't know if he likes it. And I thought that was really interesting. And he said that Johnny Toe and Ringo Lamb are just like 
they're both so invested in the craft in their own ways that they communicate in this very unique way that was very odd for him. And it, it's it's really cool to hear him talk about working with them. And I highly recommend listening to that. And they, it's funny because they also talk about The Victim, which came out in 1999, which is another Ringo Lamb film. He loves that movie, Peter Kim. And he and Frank talk about that movie, which is, I've never seen that film, which is really cool. So I'm talking about Full Alert. I loved this movie. As like obviously, I've watched it five times this year. Right, this is a great Ringo Lamb film. This might be like top five Ringo Lamb films for me personally, just because I love that minutia of the craft and the morality and the stuff that he's doing in there. Uh, it's it's November twenty second of twenty twenty one is a release date. Like I said, it's Eureka. It's a Region B release. It's Ringo Lamb's Full Alert from nineteen ninety seven. My name is Will. This is Hong Kong Cinema Appreciation Society. As always, I thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time.